Hi, this is Mike from Mike's Advanced Learning Reviews and How To, and on today's video we'll be taking a look at something a little bit different. We don't normally take a look at Intel stuff, but being that Intel is now starting to become somewhat of the, uh, the value king of the PC market, it's about time we took a look. So today we'll be taking a look at the ASUS B560 Tough Gaming Wi-Fi. Keep watching to find out more. Okay, so in today's video, we're taking a look at this board here. This is the ASUS Tough Gaming B560 Wi-Fi Gaming. The reason why we got this is it did come up as a particularly good deal, which uh, those of you that follow us on ShopSmart and also in our community tab will have seen this already. This we managed to get from Amazon Germany for about £110, which I think is actually a fantastic price. Although, if you do bear in mind the equivalent kind of AMD models, such as the Tomahawk B550, which you can pick up for around about 130 to 150, the gaming Wi-Fi for kind of 110, 120. This puts this into a slightly different category. But when you look at the opposing side of how much the processors cost these days, looking at a reasonable six core processor, you're looking at around about 150 to 180 for a Ryzen 5 3600. Or if you go down the used route and maybe look at a Intel chip, such as something which we've picked up, which is the 10600, you can pick those up for about 130. So yeah, potentially where you're looking and where you're buying, you may find that the Intel route actually at the moment is the preferable choice. Hence why we've got this board and we'll be taking a look at it today, going through, doing a unboxing, look at all the accessories, looking at the board itself and going through some of my opinions. Now I will be completely honest with you, I am very much out of touch with Intel's goings on over the last couple of years for obvious reasons, being that AMD has been the, uh, the king of the crop so far, but it's time that we took a look at this. I'm actually looking to replace my existing setup in the streaming PC behind me and replacing it with this and again the 10600 processor which hopefully should be a little bit better for things like video editing and that kind of stuff and for streaming which is primarily what we use that PC for. So anyway, with all that said, let's get into the motherboard. So for those of you that are new to the Tough Gaming Alliance range of components and accessories, essentially what it is is a lot of companies and some components which come together underneath the ASUS umbrella to bring you essentially what is top range components but with limited frills and bells and whistles but for a pretty decent price. So you get all of the quality but not all of the uh, fluff and fancy stuff. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's get into this. So first of all, looking at the box, as you can see, so this is the Tough Gaming motherboard, the B560 Plus Wi-Fi. This has Wi-Fi 6 and also has Bluetooth 5.1 for those interested. So yes, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth are catered with straight away out of the box. So yeah, hopefully we won't be getting too many comments asking if it has Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. Looking at the bottom, it goes through some of the individual specs of what it supports. So this supports 11th gen Intel processors and 10th gen Intel processors. Although there are some caveats if you're using 10th gen, which we'll touch on a little bit later as we go through, but essentially because 10th gen not supporting PCI Express Gen 4, there are some limitations in regards to the PCI Express slots, M.2 drives, etc., etc. Also, you've got things like DTS custom, you've got headset support, gaming support, HDMI outputs, Wi Fi 6, like we said, PCI Express Gen 4, and obviously Aurora Sync for RGB, both 12 volt RGB and 5 volt addressable RGB. Moving on to the back of the box, goes through a ton of more specs, so I'll give you some close-ups of this. Uh, basically tells you about the rear panel I.O. support, USBs, wireless and Bluetooth, etc., Ethernet, which on this board, actually, the Ethernet is a, a strange one. It actually supports 2.5 gigabit LAN, so not everybody has 2.5 gigabit switches, but future-proofing if you're on a gigabit network at the moment, and potentially you're going to be upgrading in the future when those devices become a sensible price, then this has got you covered. Also on this board, we've got graphics support as well. So if you're using a processor which has an onboard graphics or an iGPU, then you can use HDMI or DisplayPort connectivity for that. No VGA, unfortunately, and no DVI-D. Some of the other highlights, which it mentions on the back of the box. So we've got the flexible M.2 heatsink, which uh, is basically reversible. So you can use it on the top or bottom slots. Pre-mounted IO shield. Also, you've got gaming network solution. So we've got Turbo LAN. And again, we've got that 2.5 gigabit ethernet. And also we have a front USB Type-C, which a lot of people these days are starting to ask for more and more as cases are starting to increase their usage across the ranges. So that's enough waffle, let's get on and see what we actually get inside the box. So first of all, we get a flip out bit here. So this is our Wi-Fi antenna system. So we've got two type SMA connectors on there, which screw into the back of the motherboard. 
and this is essentially like a stand system so you can plug that put it on top of your pc that kind of thing or maybe move it slightly further away i actually quite like this because you've got a length of cable there you can move the antenna so it's going to be in the position where it's going to pick up a wi-fi signal a little bit better although with wi-fi 6 you do get increased features such as mimo and beam forming so yeah most of those wi-fi dropout problems that you may have had previously then hopefully this should be reduced greatly next is the board itself which we'll take a look at in more depth later so next up we get a pair of SATA cables, one with a right angle, one with straight connections. We also get a driver DVD should you need it. There are some M.2 mountings and screws. Also included are some pads as well, so if you've got a single sided M.2 drive you can use those to pack out the space in between the M.2 shield and the drive itself. There's a whole bunch of tough stickers which you can use on various parts of your PC. There is a certificate of reliability, which uh, yeah, take that with a grain of salt. There is an in-depth user manual and the usual C stuff and a quick start guide. So let's start taking a look at the actual board itself. Now, as you can see in the middle here, we've got this tough gaming shield on here, which is what you normally get on Intel boards to cover up the pins, just in case you bend them, that sort of thing. This board obviously supports LGA 1200 type processors. So that is Intel 10th gen and 11th gen. Again, we'll put the full details on the screen so you can see what processors are supported, but pretty much it's uh, yeah, all the 10th gen and 11th gen processors. One of the things which I noticed straight away when I put this board out of the box is the weight of it. It's actually a really heavy board. You've got a six layer PCB. You've also got these really chunky heat sinks for the VRM, which is an eight plus one design using the DRMOS setup. Not quite as good as the Z590 counterpart of this particular type tough board, which I believe has, I think it's 14 plus two setup. So yeah, slightly reduced, but again, what this is intended for, this isn't intended for hardcore overclocking. This is your kind of mid-range board for people who just want to put in their processor, not worry about anything too much like frequencies, timing, etc. Just enable XMP and get on and use the system. If you do want to overclock and you do want to make those subtle adjustments, then essentially you are going to have to go to the next range up, i.e. the Z590 range. So let's look at connectivity. So in the top left corner, as you'd expect, you've got your 8-pin EPS connector, doesn't really need more than an eight pin on this one. 125 watt delivery is gonna be absolutely fine for this. There are thermal limitations and also current regulations on this board. They're not as strict as some of the other models on the market, such as ASRocks and some of the Gigabyte boards. This comes out of the box with those kind of restrictions disabled. So if you are using a slightly higher wattage processor, there aren't gonna be that many restrictions. Again, obviously you can't overclock a great deal, so it's just things like Intel's Turbo Boost. Moving along from that at the top here, so again, we've got this massive heatsink. There are two CPU fan headers, so CPU one and CPU optional. So if you're using a CPU cooler with two fans on there, then you can plug both of those in and control them in the BIOS. If you've got something like an AIO, 240mm AIO, and you've got two fans on there, again, absolutely perfect, plug them straight into there. Next to that is actually the diagnostic D-LEDs, which are extremely helpful, especially if you get into that no-boot situation. So you can tell if either the CPU's not installed correctly, your RAM's not installed, your VGA's not working, all those kinds of things. So diagnostic LED on the top, which is always good to see. Next to that, there is a pair of RGB connections. So one of which is the 12 volt, which is the top one. So that is gonna be for your older style RGB lighting. For the newer five volt stuff, we've got a connector on the side here. So that is the three pin five volt connection. Good places to have them actually. So you've got a pair up here and also there's a pair at the bottom. So depending on what your setup is and your RGB likings, you may have something going on at the top. You may have something going on at the front. So yeah, it's nice to have those connections in multiples across the board. Moving across, we've got our RAM slots. So this supports up to 128 gigabytes of RAM. RAM speed and frequency is gonna be one thing which people may have kind of issues or have to do some working out what they can actually do. In theory, the board supports up to DDR4 5000 megahertz speeds, although reality, depending on what processor you're using, if you're using 11th gen, then potentially you might get there. If you're using 10th gen, realistically, you're probably gonna be limited around about 3600. I have seen people use this board with something like a 10400 and get DDR4 3600 working no problems at all. Obviously, your mileage will vary, and the defaults for the processors, so 10th gen up to 2933 realistically, and 11th gen kind of tops out around about 3200 as their native speeds. But again, anything over that is essentially classes and overclock, so yeah, your mileage might vary. Moving back across again, we've got our CPU slot here with the plastic cover, so yeah, no problems there. You probably notice actually from some of the B-roll, you'll probably see that already there is a slight difference between what I filmed in B-roll and what you can see now. The big difference is the fact that we've got our M.2 shield is currently in our bottom slot. 
Normally, when you open this up out of the box, it will be in this top slot here. There is only one M.2 shield, which is a little bit of a pain, and I guess it wouldn't have cost a great deal extra to include two in the box. But having said that, a lot of modern drives, especially PCI Express Gen 4 drives, will come with an included heatsink anyway. So yeah, possibly not that big a deal. Also as well, do bear in mind, if you are using a 10th gen processor, this top slot is connected by PCI Express Gen 4 to 11th gen processors. So if you've got 11th gen, that'll work absolutely fine with PCI Express drives. If you're using 10th gen on this board, then this slot will be disabled, meaning you can only use one on the bottom. So do bear that in mind. Another item of notice on this particular section is the Q-clamp, which is ASUS's own design for securing M.2 drives. Now, bizarrely, I'm not too sure how they've kind of worked out that this is a good idea. I guess it is in theory, because all you do is just move the clip around and it holds the drive in place, so you don't have to fumble around with those tiny little screws. But sadly, because of the way they're mounted, they only support 2211 size drives, whereas realistically, most people these days are on 2280 or smaller. This doesn't actually come out, it is kind of fixed into the board at least. I cannot find a way of getting out, even with pliers, etc. I have tried. So if you are using smaller drives, then you will need to use the included standoffs in the box, which kind of makes this redundant. Yeah, would have been nice to have seen those to actually be removable and to be able to move them along the different sizes. So yeah, bit of shame, but it is what it is. Moving across a little bit further, so we've got two fan headers there, one of which technically is a pump header, so that's for AIOs. Then you've got a chassis fan header on the back there. All of the headers, apart from the AIO one, are fully controllable in PWM and voltage DC, both in the BIOS and also the ASUS software, which you can use if you want to within Windows 10 or Windows 11. The AIO pump one effectively runs at full speed all the time, so if you do plug a fan in there, yeah, it's uh, going to be running pretty noisily. Moving down, we've got our PCI Express Gen 4 times 16 slot. So yeah, depending again what processor you're using, 10th gen, this is going to be limited to PCI Express Gen 3 times 16. If you're using 11th gen, PCI Express Gen 4 times 16 full speed. Moving back across, so we've got our 24 pin ATX power connection. Underneath that, we've got a pair of USB connections for front panel connectors. So we've got a traditional USB 3.0 front panel connector there. And underneath that, we've got the Type-C one. Again, really nice to see that included. Coming down a little bit further, so we've got two of our first SATA ports, and that is followed up by another four at the bottom there. If you are using the bottom M.2 slot, then SATA 2 actually will be disabled because of sharing, etc. Very much like what we see in some of the B550 and B450 chipsets. So nothing unusual there, but yeah, it is a little bit of a pain. Moving slightly across, we've got the chipset cooler there which has got the tough branding on it which again very nice and no fans which is always good to see moving across from there we've got our bios battery which there are stickers included so if you don't like your shiny bios battery you can actually put an asus tough sticker over the top of it um, i would probably rather put a rtx 3090 over it but the chances of that happening are very minimal moving underneath that so we've got a pci express gen 3 times one slot Underneath that, a PCI Express Gen 3 times 16 slot, but this is actually only wired for times four. So yeah, don't be getting any ideas of uh, SLI on this board. Underneath that, another two PCI Express Gen 3 times one ports. We've got our M.2 slot at the bottom here. Again, PCI Express Gen 3 times four supported and under, and this will support NVMe and SATA drives. On the side, just to here, is RGB lighting as well, which uh, ties in with the rest of the system. So you can control that in the BIOS and also in the Aurora Sync software, or even, if you dare, the Armory Crate software. The bottom M.2 slot also does have the, uh, the Q-clip as well for retaining M.2 drives, but again, is in the rather daft position of the 2211 size drives, which actually, to this day, I've still never actually even owned or seen. So, yeah, good one, Asus. So moving down to the uh, the slightly more boring components at the bottom, so we've got a RTC reset or CMOS reset switch there. You've got your SATA ports, the four SATA ports there as we talked about earlier. Front panel I.O. connections. Next to that, there's a pair of RGB connectors, one of which is a 5 volt and one of which is a 12 volt, so both of those are covered. Again, they just replicate what we've got in the top, so top and bottom is always really good for wiring things up and not having too many wires straying across the board. Moving across from that, so we've got a pair of USB 2.0 ports for wiring for uh, front panel connectors, that kind of thing, or maybe something like the Corsair ecosystem, IQ, etc., etc. Next to that, we've got two fan headers. Again, PWM 4-pin can be used with PWM or VDC and controlled in the BIOS, etc. Next to that, there is a Thunderbolt header. So if you wanted to, you can actually get an accessory from ASUS to add Thunderbolt to your system. Again, plug it into that header there. Moving across from that, we've got a COM port, which, yeah. 
I don't know why they still include those, but it is there if you wanted it to. Next that is our front panel connector for HD audio. And then we've got some Nichicon capacitors and our audio chip going on down here, which is the Realtek ALC897. Nice feature of the chipset is actually built-in AI support, so for noise cancelling in bi-directional, so for microphone and for headset. So if communication is your thing, this board got you covered. One thing of note, which I haven't come across, but I'm assured it is actually in here, this board does support TPM 2.0 out of the box. Where the chip is on the board, I have no idea whatsoever. I am showing my ignorance there, sadly. I don't even know whether it's built into the chips. I don't think it is. I'm not entirely sure. And sadly, at the moment, my processor hasn't arrived from CEX, so we have to wait for the follow-up video to see how that all works and what the deal is with that. If you want to see what that video is like, and also we'll do a run-through of the BIOS settings, etc., make sure you're subscribed and click on the chime icon and you'll be notified of future video releases. On the back of the board, nothing much to speak of. We've got a metal back plate there for the socket itself. And another thing which I noticed as well, you've got the screws here and here, and also there and there which are in relation to those M.2 retainers, which, again, there's a screw there, so in theory you'd think it would come out. I haven't managed to get them out. If anyone knows how to get them out so you can move them to different places, please do let me know, because I don't think it's actually possible, but maybe it is, maybe I'm completely wrong. So that is pretty much for everything actually on the board. Let's take a look at what is actually on the back of the board. So as you can see, we've got an integrated IO shield, which is always really nice to see. Something which we actually we didn't get on the uh, Tough Gaming Wi-Fi on the X570 range for AMD, that was a separate backplate, which, yeah, things can get lost, so it's really nice to see that integrated. We have got all of our connectivity here, and actually a pretty decent selection. So starting off, we've got our DisplayPort connection there next to HDMI. Now, depending on what processor you're gonna be using on this board, obviously, if you're using 10th gen, you're gonna get a slightly inferior performance from those two ports than what you would with 11th gen with their uprated iGPU. Uh, again, full details of that will be in the video description below, so you can click on that. Moving along to our USB ports, so at the top here we've got two USB 2.0, underneath that we've got the first of our super speed, so that's USB 3.2 Gen 1, underneath there are two of those. Another USB 2.0, so we've got three of those in total. Underneath that we've got a USB Type-C, which is the USB 3.2 Gen 2. Also there's another two super speed ports there as well, which is USB 3.2 Gen 2. Above that we've got our Realtek 2.5 gigabit Ethernet, and next that we've got our SMA connectors for the Wi-Fi on board. You can, if you want to, just get SMA aerials and screw those straight on if you wanted to, but being that they include that nice mount in the box, then it seems a little bit of a shame to waste that. Next that we've got our audio outputs, so you've got your traditional color-coded outputs, and also there is a Speedif optical, which is nice if you want to use this as some sort of media center. Okay, so that is pretty much it for a tour of the board. Uh, sadly, again, can't show you the BIOS because I don't have a processor as of yet, but that will be coming in very shortly, so stay tuned for that one. Overall, what do I think of this? It's a really difficult one for me because Intel has always been one of those things which have been very much on my periphery. I've always been, pretty much recently, entirely AMD-based. So this, for me, is actually uh, yeah, a little bit of a leap of faith, especially seeing as we're kind of months away from the next range of processors coming out from Intel. So we probably would expect to see these boards reduced even further. Now the original retail price for this is somewhere in the £150 mark. I picked it up for about 110 which for me I think is pretty much where it should be. In fact, being what it is, probably a little bit less. And I think if Intel boards in general were overall cheaper, I think Intel will have a, a much better time of it in the market at the moment, even though their processors are slightly lacking performance-wise in certain areas and also possibly slightly more expensive in some instances. But some of the lower end processors, the uh, 10100, the 10400, 10600, etc, etc, are all pretty decent prices on the, both the new and the used market. So there is a temptation to go for this kind of thing. I'll be honest with you, until I've actually built it and tested it and given it a good run, I really don't know how I feel about this. In theory, it should be absolutely fine. There are certain instances where Intel do better, especially for me personally, being that I'm going to be using the system primarily for streaming and OBS recording, that kind of stuff. Those are the kind of areas where Intel generally does tend to dominate somewhat, especially in things like Adobe Premiere. But anyway, that has been the ASUS B560 Tough Gaming Wi-Fi Plus. Let me know what you think about it in the comments section. I've been Mike, this is Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To, and hopefully we'll catch you in the very next video. Thanks for watching.